I invite you to take your Bible, if you have it with you today, to the book of Galatians. Uh, as well, if you have a scripture journal that we provided for you, I know there uh, we're almost out of those, so you've been taking advantage of those. We've got a, a little ways to go yet in, in our series in Galatians, uh, the series that we've entitled the the Free Life, and it is uh, it's been it's been good, and we continue to to walk through it. But we're walking through particularly the the characteristics or the aspects of the fruit of the spirit a little bit topically. Uh, in the next little bit, and today we are looking at the fruit of the Spirit, patience. I had thought about standing up here and just uh, standing here for a while, and then just waiting to see how restless you got, but I thought, okay, I'm not, I'm not patient enough for that, I've got, you know, I've got to get going here, so... Uh, here we go. Let's, uh, what I want to invite you to do is t- to turn to Galatians chapter 5, and we are primarily looking at the, the verse 22 uh, part, but I want to take us back a little bit um, out to uh, verse 16 to 26 just to get a little bit of the context today, and I apologize, I got a bit of a cold today, but we will, we will make it through together. <clears throat> here we go, Galatians 5, 16 to 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Father, we thank you today for your word, that it speaks truth, it speaks life to us. We connect with your spirit and with your voice within these words. Uh, God, we, we know that we need you. We know that we need your strength and your empowering to live the life that you've called us to. So I pray today that these, these words and your spirit would awaken our heart to you and draw us in our affections, in our will, in our behaviors, in our attitudes towards a life of conformity to Jesus. Amen. Would someone describe you as a patient person? I don't know if anyone is really described or defined as a patient person. Maybe. Maybe you know of someone, someone that you would say, that that person is just, they're so patient. They've been so patient. Maybe you've been at a, you know, a place where you've uh, got service at a coffee place or something, and, and uh, you know, you were, you were just standing there, you were you're just looking at the menu board, and you didn't know what you wanted, and, and the person was, you know, the, waiting on you there, and they were just like, you know, can I help you? What would you like? And you're like, I'm not sure... And you're just kind of standing there, and, and they were just like, they were just super patient with you. Like, they just waited and waited, and even though there was a lineup behind you, um, they just said, eh, well, whatever, take your time. Um, maybe um, that is, that's what you think of when you think of, you know, that was a patient person. I know some of you have spent some time recently in the emergency room, maybe five or six hours waiting. That tests your patience. Or Sundays. I used to believe that Sunday mornings were God's way of of testing, you know, the strength of our marriage. 
we had at that time one car. And I, by nature, like to be early. And also it's, it's kind of my role to be at church and typically earlier than some. But it's not that, that my wife, Tanya, is, is always a, a late person. Honestly, like, she considers the time and she decides that she has time for other things, like another coffee. She desires to fill each moment. But, you know, early in our marriage, I used to sit and when we had that one car and I had to go. And I would sit in the car and I would honestly be kind of fuming a little bit until she came out, maybe, you know, a little honking of the horn. I learned that didn't go well. <laughs> but now we've solved it. We have two cars. <laughs> but, you know, the other aggravating thing about it all is that she's almost always right. Right? That's the thing. It's like, I get there, I got to be early, you know, what could happen, everything, but it's, it's actually, we get there in the right amount of time, and there's more time than I think that we have. But see, when we go to the airport, I have absolutely no problem with being there two hours early, because I read the instructions, and it says, this is when you should arrive. There must be good reason for that. And for Tanya, she takes that as more of like a rough guideline. I like to get through security and relax, have a coffee. Tanya also likes to have a coffee, but sometimes it's, it's a bit of a scramble. She would say, well, why would we be there so early? Why would we do that? But this is not marriage therapy. This is a sermon. So, but this is the way it is. It, there's tests of our patience. Perhaps for you, Sunday mornings for you to get out the door. There's maybe someone in your family or someone as a friend you're, you know, you're waiting, waiting for. How, okay, let's just do a test here. How many of you are really like early people? You like to be there early. How many, how many of you would be more like, ah, you know, time, it's kind of fluid? type of people. All right. See, this is where we have to develop the unity of the body among us, right? Uh, we have a, our leadership group that's going, and I tell you, out of these 12 people, I tell you, most, they're just like, they're there quarter to seven. They're so early. It's wonderful. Love them. <laughs> uh, okay, where are we going here? All right. Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is patience today. Now, there is a deep connection. Of course, all of these aspects of this, this fruit of the Spirit are connected. And so we talked about love, and it's this, this agape love, this self-sacrificing love. Or joy, it's this rooted in our relationship with Jesus, regardless of our circumstances. And last week, peace, that we've been reconciled with God and also called to live in peace with others. And so patience is also deeply connected to this. Now, if you have <clears throat> what we've been reading in with the ESV, you see that the word there, patience, is used. If you have a New King James Version, it says long-suffering. Long-suffering. This is a word that doesn't sound as good as patience, right? Long-suffering. Suffering. It doesn't roll off the tongue, especially, you know, in that Fruit of the Spirit song. We often do that at camp, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. It throws it all off. Doesn't work, right? It's an uncomfortable word, words, long-suffering. I guess it is one word. Long-suffering. It's two words. <laughs> it's rough today. See, long-suffering, we don't, we don't want long-suffering, right? We want, we want short-suffering, or better yet, zero-suffering would be our preference, right? Or if you have a New International Version, uh, I think it says forbearance, forbearance. That's a word that we don't often use, you know, our kids are driving us crazy or whatever. You are testing my forbearance. It doesn't, 
doesn't work as well. But they have a little bit of different nuance to them. But there's actually two Greek words in Scripture that are used to describe this, this patience or this, this long suffering. The first, first word that's Greek is makrothumia. Okay, it's a little tricky to say, but it's this, this macro, it's this macro part of it is the long part, and the, the thumos is like the, there's this anger. So it's kind of like long anger, but it doesn't mean that you should be angry for a long time. <laughs> it's just like that it's a, it's a slow, slowness to anger. This has to do with patience with people. And so it's connected to, to relationships, connected to, to love. So what it is, is, is a really an opposite of, of the short fuse, you know, when something just gets you and you just fly off the handle. There's, there's rage that just kind of happens right away. That, this is the, the opposite of that. You're slow to anger. Probably told you this before, um, this illustration, but my, my sister... And I, I have two sisters that are older. My one sister that I, I grew up with more, she was three and a half years older than me. And she pushed my buttons, like a lot. And so we often were told uh, that we needed to get along better. <laughs> and, uh, but she, she would kind of poke my buttons. I, I look back now and I think, I wonder what my part in it was. Because I always thought I was so innocent. I was, just, I was, the, I was the only child, the, the baby. I, it couldn't have been me, right? Couldn't have been me. I couldn't have done this wrong. But I, I, I think there was something in my sister as well. It just, she just liked to, to kind of poke, you know, and, and stir up some stuff. And I don't know if any of you have siblings like that. But we're good now. But she, would, uh, she was taking German in school. We had to take German. We didn't take French or anything. We took German. And she learned some German words that I don't think they taught, actually, in the, in the class. But she would call me these German words. And I don't even know what they meant. I don't even know if they were that bad, but it was the tone. And it was like the, you know, she was just trying to get under my skin, so she would call me these, these things to get me kind of riled up, which I did. And one particular time, she was calling me these, these words, and, and I just... You know, whatever I had in my hand, I was going to throw it at her, and it was a Rubik's Cube. And I had really good aim. <laughs> and I threw it. I got so mad, I threw it right at her. Got it right, right in the eye. It was almost like the imprint of the nine squares right there. And she had a you know, big black eye. I had to wear sunglasses for a week. And man, did I get in trouble for that one. But there was that, that shortness of, of fuse this is, this is the opposite of that when it deals with, you know, patience, long-suffering with people. The other word is, is hupomene. Hupomene, if you remember this from our, our series in James, we talked about this, this word, talking about steadfastness or endurance, right? And it is, is patience in circumstances, Staying on course, no matter what comes along the path. And so in James, of course, it talks about this in, in James 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of many kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces hupomene, steadfastness, endurance. And let hupomene have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So it's, it's when circumstances, when trials, hardships come your way, that you have this long-suffering attitude. And this is connected to hope. Verse that we've been reading the last couple weeks from Romans chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 3 today, just says, not, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces hupomene, endurance. And hupomene Endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So these are these, this two, 
kind of nuances of this, this long-suffering, this patient, steadfast character of followers of Jesus who have received the Spirit and the Spirit who's producing this fruit in their lives. So you have patience with people and endurance in circumstances in life. We see this uh, beautifully laid out in Colossians chapter 1. It says, And so from the day that we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, here comes, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. We need the strength of God for this, to have endurance in circumstances and to have patience with people because we're going to run up against it, right, in our, in our life. The, the path of a Christian that God calls us to walk is not smooth or straight. We wouldn't mature that way. Instead, we walk in difficult circumstances, and we're going to encounter difficult people. This is going to require long suffering, and we get the strength to deal with this from God. Now, in this particular passage in Galatians, we're, we're talking about this type of, the type of patience that is dealing primarily with, with people, with relationships. This is that, that nuance of that word. So we refer back to the works of the flesh that we read earlier that the Apostle Paul has, has just spoken of, this, these things that are in opposition to the Spirit. And we see the things that he mentioned in there as far as enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. And that's the, the background or the context of this, this letter to the churches in Galatia. It was a church that was divided. See, there was confrontation with the truth of the gospel, and we've walked through that in this series, how Paul says this, this, there's a distortion of the gospel that he has he passed on to these early this church and they received it with joy the truth of the gospel and the gospel of grace that they were not under law but then these judaizers came in and they said no that's not enough you can have jesus yes wonderful faith in christ what he did for you but you also need to add the law circumcision, dietary restrictions, all these things you need to do. And Paul says, no, that's a distortion of the gospel. So he calls that out clearly. And that is clear. But he also describes how the Spirit gives freedom and grace, which enables us to love each other. And so there was divisions in this church. Table fellowship was fractured. And so he's seen the works of the flesh evident, as he says, in this body of believers, in these churches. And so the Spirit gives this fruit, a fruit of patience, long-suffering with each other. So who is this talking about? Well, in lots of ways, we, we recognize this, who we need to have patience with. But there's those who annoy you, frustrate you, and take up your time. pastor that I, I knew early in my years of, of ministry said, if, if people would just leave me alone, I could get some work done. And I remember, and I, I wrote it down, I'm just saying, you know, I think that people are our work. And so people are going to take up our time. And so I want to say this clearly to you, church, Please do not ever say, oh, my pastor doesn't have time for me. I can't reach out to my pastor. I can't reach out to our, our elders. Are, they're so busy. You know, these people that I, I serve with, I, that, that, is, that is what we are to do. That is what a pastor should do is to minister and know 
the sheep. But yeah, you can be a messy bunch. <laughs> you are the way that the Lord tests my patience. <laughs> but that's good. That's what it's for. That's how we grow in, in love for each other. But we also know we need to have patience or long-suffering. There's those who would, would mock us for being Christians, who would seek to tear us down. There are those who, who will sin against us, even repeatedly. And the natural desire of the flesh is to retaliate, to seek revenge, war. But that's contrary to the spirit. Now hear me, I'm not saying that, you know, people that are obviously uh, doing like bad things and aggressive against us, uh, that we should just lie down and say, oh, I'm just long suffering here, just like continue to walk over me. That's not what I'm saying. But there, there is a, there's a difference between that and flying off the handle in rage, the short fuse. It's being patient with people, let, actually hearing their, their story, maybe why they're acting a certain way. Anyways, there's lots of reasons. But it's not saying just, well, I'm just going to be, whatever you do to me is okay. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But there is an ultimate justice of God that we entrust ourselves to as well. All right, so... Focus of it is patience, but the foundation of this patience is God's patience with us. The fruit, of course, is from the Spirit. This is who God is, how he has always been, how he always will be. Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's who God revealed himself right from the very beginning. A God who is slow to anger. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There's times where I, I get impatient with God. And I'm like, man, look at the state of our world. Look at everything that's going on. I'm ready. Ready for your return. Come, Lord. We can get impatient. But God, it says, is not slow. He is patient with us. He doesn't want anyone to perish, so he's, he's allowing more time for more to come to know him. Think about this. Do you, do you recognize the way that God has been patient with you? You know, we sin, we have idols, we stray and we disobey, and we act selfishly, but then we come to him and he forgives. And this is the foundation for how we are in turn to have patience with others. He's been patient with us. Okay, the spirit-filled, the spirit-led life that Paul is talking about it's really marked by a determination to not give up on someone. To not give up on someone. To stick with it. Stick with people. You know, most of our, us, we're, we're familiar with this idea of cancel culture. Or just people, someone that says something we disagree with or does something and we just like, that's it. You're dead to me. You know, done. Done with you. This is the opposite of how, you know, we are to be as Christ followers, not to give up on, on people. You know, the aspect of the Spirit's fruit is, is very personal. It strikes home for each of us. And so as we're talking about this, right now you might have a, a very clear person in mind or a relationship or where you're thinking about, okay, i got to be more patient with this person or long-suffering. It might be a work relationship, family relationship, might be your marriage. Might be your kids. Friendship. Even someone in this room. 
But for the rest of this time, I simply want you to consider a few broader nuances of this patience in, in relationships. Where there's always a temptation for us just to, to give up, to cancel the relationship. All right, here we go. First of all, don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Mind-blowing truth here, but sometimes God is hard to understand. His ways, his purposes, his word, sometimes it's just like, can be confusing, can be unclear. You know, there's, there's a quote by, by Spurgeon that I've, I've shared with a few people recently because they've been wrestling with some things in Scripture and, and it doesn't solve everything, but it, I just find it helpful. It says this, So is it always throughout Holy Scripture, wherever there are difficult places, they do not touch vital truths. The matter of our salvation is plain enough. The book of Revelation may be difficult, but not the gospel according to Matthew. With regard to the future, there may be many clouds, but with regard to that blessed day which is past, which was the crisis of the world's history, when our Savior hung upon the tree, the darkness is past, and the true light shineth there. Don't, therefore, busy yourselves most about those things which are most difficult, for they are usually of least importance. Concern your heart most with the simplicities of the gospel, for it is there in the way, the truth, and the life that the essential matter lies." So maybe for you, you're, you're wrestling with some, some things in Scripture, some concepts about God and, and how He's at work in your life. It's not that you can't press into some difficult things, but hold on, hold firm to the truth, to the simplicities of the gospel, and in many ways, that will open your eyes to and illuminate some of your, your ways that you're, you're not so sure on with God, instead of just saying, that's it, I can't get it, I'm done. We also go through suffering through silent times where God isn't necessarily uh, cl seeming close to us and sharing and, and we're not hearing his voice or prayers don't seem to be answered. And again, there's just this, this temptation to just like ah, throw in the towel. I was thinking about this with, uh, you know, when, when we watch a TV show or something on Netflix and we're, maybe it's a, a series of something, and we watch that first episode and that first episode that, you know, it's just like, ah, oh, I'm not really drawn to the characters. The script is kind of forced. It's kind of this slow burn. And we're like, I'm out. Done. Or maybe the, that first episode just blows you away and you're, you're hooked. But then it slows down. And you've had a hard day. And you fall asleep. Your friends or your spouse throws the remote at you wake you up. Listen, we can't live out our faith like we choose our media viewing in short bursts of entertainment or, or dopamine shots. Eugene Peterson wrote a book called A Long Road in the Same Direction. And in it, he talks about the difference between a tourist and a pilgrim. See, a, a tourist just wants to go see the highlights, see the best locations, Check out the attractions and, and sites at their leisure. But a pilgrim is on a journey. And it can be a long road, but it's a journey in our faith, a journey of obedience. And so I'd ask you today, is, are you a tourist or a pilgrim? Is your relationship with Christ strong enough for the long haul? Don't give up on your faith, on God. Secondly, don't give up on the community of faith. The church, of course, is, is people. It's not a building. It's not this, this service. Scripture tells us to, to, not, to not forsake meeting together. Keep the, the priority of gathering together with believers as, as crucial. And this isn't going to be about entertainment or, or how much you can get out of, out of church. Don't give up on the family of, of God. Today you might say, look around and say, this, this might be your, your faith community. Or, you know, over time or things move, things change, you might find another faith community. The kingdom of God is big. 
But wherever you find yourself, lean in, knowing that it's going to take some relational risk. There are people that are just like you, (laughs) that are hesitant, that maybe have experienced some church hurt, don't exactly know where they fit in the life of a church body, don't understand maybe their gifts or where they can serve. People that are just lonely, need friendship. There's people like you. But take a step. Move towards it. You need a spiritual family to walk with you on this pilgrimage. Paul gives an urging word for us today in Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So with humility and gentleness, with patience, bear with one another. If you're going to do that, you're going to have to get a little bit closer to each other. This time, this hour, stepping in here at 1035 and leaving at 1205, it's it's not going to do it. You've got to find ways to lean in. Third, and finally, don't, don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on yourself. Throughout this, this book of Galatians, we've talked a lot about justification. I'm just going to go through two things that are really important words for you and in, in your faith and, and for you to understand maybe where you're at in terms of God and, and your uh, discipleship journey. The first is justification, and this is this word that means you've been justified, you've been declared righteous. And this is what God does. He declares sinners righteous by faith in the work of Christ. You've been forgiven of your sins, you have peace with God, and you are welcomed, adopted into the family of God. And this is the new position that we have before God, and it's made possible only through the grace of God in Jesus. Nothing that you've done, Nothing that you could ever do. No works, no obedience to the law, anything. It's only through the grace of God, through faith in what he did. And you've been declared righteous. It's your position. Then there's sanctification. And this is God's transformation of a believer's whole self. Your mind, your will, your behaviors, and your affections through the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the growing process of spiritual maturity and conforming to the image of Christ. And so this sanctifying journey, this is becoming more like Christ day by day. And it seems slow. And there might be temptations and traps that you have fallen into for years. And you come to a place where you say, I think this is just who I am. And it's never going to change. And you get very impatient with yourself. You're thinking, I've been a Christian for a long time. This is areas that I should have been victorious. This is where I should see more of the Spirit's fruit in my life. And you get down on yourself and maybe you feel like giving up. 2 Corinthians 3.18 talks about being transformed into the image of Jesus more and more, day by day, moment by moment, glory upon glory. His work in you is is changing you, is transforming you. Sometimes it's hard to see. Often our worst critic is ourselves. We know our flaws. We look in the mirror. We look into the eyes that have failed, have sinned, and fallen short. But you know, alongside receiving the grace and the forgiveness of God, he's actually been growing his fruit in you, in us. There's been changes. You know, I don't throw Rubik's Cubes anymore. (laughs) I don't honk at my wife to get in the car anymore. I wait on God more as I've seen his faithfulness. It's been proven time and time again. So ask yourself, where where have I seen the Spirit's fruit growing in my life? And stop and, and give thanks to God for what he's been doing. I invite you to stand and our, our team's going to come up and we're going to sing a song. When do you pray um, this if you feel so led? Holy Spirit, today I surrender to you 
Would you grow your fruit in my life? Would you let patience be manifest in my relationships as I grow in becoming like you, Jesus? Amen.